Hello everyone, my name is Mark Ainsworth-Smith and I'm the consultant pre-hospital care practitioner for South Central Ambulance Service, often known as SCAS. I'm going to tell you about our experience using electronic patient records. Just a brief overview, SCAS is one of 14 different ambulance services across the UK. Um, as you can see, we're right on the southern uh, tip of the UK. And we basically all have the same response targets, no matter which ambulance service we work for. Um, cardiac arrest, for example, there's a target time of seven minutes. Um, we've got very similar clinical care in terms of the standards of care that we deliver, but we have to evidence that using what we call ACQI. So that's ambulance care quality indicators. And there'll always be a degree of some local commissioning. So for example, strokes in rural areas are much more difficult than perhaps in some of the urban areas that we cover. We operate in quite a complex setting. Our general population is about 4 million. Uh, during the day that swells because of commuters uh, up to about something like 5.5 million. Um, we cover a large patch ranging from the most rural type of areas in Hampshire and Oxfordshire and some parts of Buckinghamshire, all the way to inner city areas such as Portsmouth, Southampton, Oxford, Reading, etc. Until 2015, SCAS used paper records. The process was fairly complicated. The ambulance crews would complete paperwork. Uh, the patient would be given a copy, usually the carbonated copy underneath. The master copy would be scanned and data analysis totally relied on humans. Indeed, we had our own team who had to scan all these forms and basically then review the information and type it into a database. Clearly, that was fairly inefficient. So we then made a decision to introduce electronic patient records. So the rollout, well, we basically had intense training for all of our staff, which included a sort of staggered rollout. We decided not to go live across the whole patch. Um, we had electronic patient record champions who basically took real devices back to their ambulance stations and showed people exactly how it works. And we had test devices so that plays, uh, staff could play with them literally on station and get a good handle on how to operate them. But by 2016, in November, we were equipped with EPR on every single one of our SCAS resources. In terms of connectivity, our EPR devices were configured to connect to our monitoring devices. Uh, this meant that, for example, physiologi physiological readings, end tidal CO2s, blood pressures, heart rates, ECGs, etc., um, are transferred wirelessly from our Zol X1 device, the monitoring device we use here in SCAS, um, onto our electronic patient records. That clearly saves a good amount of time, uh, and actually, the accuracy, the information recorded, it, it, it's exact because obviously blood pressures, etc., are transported across without the need for a human to intervene in that process. Electronic patient records allow real-time electronic transfer of information. First of all, we can send information from the scene. So, for example, if we go to a serious road accident, we can take a picture uh, of the scene and we can send that straight through to the emergency department. As soon as we select the receiving hospital, then that hospital is able to view the data. Uh, we can send information through to specialist centres, so we have hyperacute stroke units and PPCI where we manage our, uh, for example, uh, heart attack cases and ACS. Now, what this allows us to do is to send the ECG through, for example, for a heart attack victim, straight through to the receiving hospital so they can be planning on the care before we've even arrived. It also allows us to transfer information to GPs and healthcare professionals. So every single day there's a push through to every GP surgery. And what that means is that the GPs can view information, particularly for patients who haven't been conveyed to hospital, but also those who have. And it allows them to get a much better understanding of their patient's condition. And in SCAS, we have a clinical support desk. This is manned by both nurses and paramedics. Um, and basically what they do is they give expert clinical advice to our staff out on the road. They're obviously able to view information real time, which is an incredibly important facet of that desk. It also allows crews to view important information. So if, for example, we've got an end of life patient who's got a DNA CPR, do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or if we've had previous attendances, then crews can view that. 
and many patients have a summary care record which basically means that we can see how they're normally managed that might be for example a patient with mental health or COPD but we can look at the management plan which obviously means that the patient gets a much better deal before we were totally unsighted on that and often it was whether we'd been out to that patient before as to whether we knew what was wrong with them and there's no doubt at all that having that sort of information can reduce unnecessary admissions to hospital and certainly we're much better informed than we ever were prior to 2016. So has the introduction of EPR been seamless? Well, I have to be completely honest, there were some teething issues. Um, these mainly related to increased on-scene times. So our on-scene times definitely increased initially when we introduced electronic patient records. That's because crews weren't completely familiar with the process and how it worked and they were quite used to paper. There was frustration for older staff, particularly those that had grown up with paper so they found it much more difficult to put everything onto electronic patient records and that did create some frustration and i'll be the first one to admit that i was one of those i've now worked for the nhs for 34 years in october and i found it really quite difficult using electronic patient records initially we even found that some staff wanted to revert to paper because it was easier. There is something about paper, but actually in the long run, I think we found generally that electronic patient records are much more thorough and actually fairly simple to complete. We did introduce some simple measures to address this. The first thing I have to say is the introduction of keyboards. A lot of staff went out and bought their own keyboards, particularly with Bluetooth adapters. This meant that they could type notes much, much faster than using a tap screen. Um, there was a lot around familiarisation and peer working. We found that the youngsters, particularly those who are recently out of university, were really quick at picking up electronic patient records. So working with older staff without question improved the process. And we had ongoing training from our champions. So at each ambulance station, there was a champion. In, in some cases, there were more than one. And they basically would talk about all the shortcuts and how you could perhaps work around things to create a perfect solution. In terms of data, data is stored in our secure data warehouse um, and information can be used for many, many purposes. Um, South Central Ambulance Service is very advanced in terms of research. We've done some great trials recently, including Paramedic 2, and this allows obviously us to retrieve data much faster than relying on humans to uh, pull down all the data for us. It also mentions, or we also talk about audit. Um, I've mentioned about ACQIs, Ambulance Care Quality Indicators. Each ambulance service has a set of standards that they have to meet. For example, for a patient having a heart attack, they have to document pain scores and they have to document, for example, that clopidogrel is given or aspirin or that we've given pain relief. And every ambulance service across the whole UK is actually measured on those ACQIs. So actually having electronic records has allowed us to complete those templates much, much easier than we ever would have had to do when we were on paper. It's also helped with planning, and I'll talk about some of the advantages, particularly, for example, with COVID. But with planning, we kind of know the areas where we're going to be busy. If we use this information intelligently, then actually we can plan where to put our resources and we can plan when we need our resources. And the key thing here is that the information on our electronic patient records is good because it's inputted by clinicians. Historically, we've always taken information from the CAD, which is where our 999 calls come in. And as everyone will be aware, although patients generally give us a rough idea of what's wrong with them, often we really don't get very much decent information at all. And in this case, what this allows us to do is to get incredibly accurate information from clinicians who basically input the data onto our electronic patient records. So this is an example of some of the output that we get. This is a map looking at, as you can see, the South Central Ambulance Service patch down to the south coast there. Um, this maps every single road to traffic collision that we have had uh, within a one year uh, sort of window. And you can see there are some hot spots there, particularly in the south of the patch around the sort of Southampton area. We've got this line going north. That's what's known as the A34, which is one of our really busy routes where a lot of heavy goods lorries sort of make their way back up north up the country and you can see that we can really accurately measure that now that can be very useful for resourcing for example with our air ambulance teams our critical care teams etc 
we can even break it down further. So this is a map looking at road traffic collisions involving motorcycles. And as you can see, we're getting some sterling data. That big blob there that you will all be able to see, you basically get uh, when there's one instant, you get one blob and the bigger the blob, the more instants you've had. And unfortunately, that is one of the absolute hotspots here in the UK. That's where motorcyclists tend to meet. There's a cafe there called Lumi's Cafe where all the bikers meet. And unfortunately, we've had a large number of fatalities around that area. And then we can look at the days of the week and also the times of day when we're most likely to see road traffic collisions. No great surprises. We often see an increase in road traffic collisions, particularly when there is commuters on the road. So as you can see, um, that period between sort of seven and nine and then four and six is when we see real peaks in activity relating to road traffic collisions. And we can also look at days of the week. And very interestingly, what we have identified is that Friday, particularly Friday afternoon, is actually one of our worst days for road traffic collisions. And the severity scores, which we've also mapped with hospitals, are much, much higher. So we know that potentially people are much, much more unwell on a Friday when they're involved in a road traffic collision. And again, that can be factored into the resourcing that we have. This is an interesting piece of work looking at falls. So this is where a patient's fallen less than two metres. And we need to remember that although that sounds a trivial injury, that 40.1% of all major trauma going into our major trauma centre at Southampton relates to a patient who's had a fall of less than two metres. So again, you can see the benefits here. We've mapped where the road traffic, where the uh, falls are happening. And you can see very clearly that we've got some really big pockets there where perhaps you might want to think about prevention teams or even having a full service run by the ambulance service. This is a piece of work that we did around stabbing. Uh, cutting edge data from the ambulance service I called the presentation. Um, unfortunately, I don't want to put anyone off uh, coming to the UK because actually it's an amazingly safe place compared to some countries, but we do see quite a significant number of stabbings within uh, our organisation and you can see the pockets there of where we've got it. They're mainly urban areas, although a stabbing can actually happen anywhere. If we break it down, this is Reading, which is in the centre of our patch. You can see that there are some big hotspots where we've seen stabbings, uh, and you can see that there's a general sort of conglomeration of them around the city centre there. And we can even break it down further. So we've gone to Portsmouth here. Portsmouth's uh, a lovely city, but it does have its fair share, particularly of trouble at night. Uh, and what you can see here is that we've got a central hub which is in the sort of central nightclub area. And then we'll see stabbings um, either side of that as well. And we can break it down even further down to real locality here. Very interestingly, the red blob to the left there, which is large, uh, I was trying to work out what that is. That's actually a police station. And that's where people go when they report having been stabbed. And the area that you'll see that looks almost just below the S of Milton Keynes, um, that's what's known as the snow dome. There's a lot of nighttime economy there. Uh, you get a lot of youngsters hanging around there in the evenings. And we think that's probably why um, we're getting so many stabbings there. This is actually work that we do in collaboration with the police. And clearly, if we identify areas, we do notify the police so that they can go and do some prevention work. But of course, if we find an area where we're likely to get stabbings, then that's where we can move our response teams who work on cars. So, for example, moving them to the centre of a city um, during the night when we know that we're going to get incidents. And if we look at the demand profile, what you'll see here, and I think this is fairly interesting, I was asked whether stabbings were going up or not. Uh, so I basically worked with our violence reduction units and what you'll see is that in November 16 we suddenly get an increase and I've circled that with red. Now I was trying to work out what's happened here but this is actually when we went fully live with electronic patient records. So what you'll see is that absolutely tallies with what I said earlier about November 16 and you'll see that there's an increase there. So we've probably got better reporting but unfortunately what we are seeing is there's a growing picture and you can see that unfortunately the trend is always upwards. We always get an increase in stabbings in summer months, so our summer when it gets hot, uh, and usually there's a bit of a reduction throughout the winter. We can also look at, for example, the days of the week and the times when our stabbings are most likely to happen. You can really understand now the importance of this for our resourcing. Uh, 
Uh, and no great surprise is that a significant number of our incidents happen in the early hours of Saturday, so from Friday night through to Saturday, and also Saturday night into Sunday. And that's when we see disproportionate numbers of stabbings, and then they tend to tail off throughout the night and then remain fairly flat during the day and then increase again in the evenings. In terms of EPR, the potential is huge, uh, obviously for health observation mapping. So what we can do is, of course, identify trends such as road traffic collisions, falls, et cetera. So we can use this for prevention. Um, we can absolutely use it to employ and use, the, use our resources appropriately, so the deployment of our resources. Um, and there's no doubt at all that there will be an improvement in clinical care. Um, we've obviously been using uh, electronic patient records for research and that will only benefit patients in the long run. And the other things we can do is, for example, to map epidemics and pandemics. So, for example, if we've got a flu uh, pandemic, then we can look at that. Um, we can look at areas of sepsis, and I have already done that piece of work. Uh, we can look at meningitis, and sadly that's often universities, particularly in that sort of September, October time. And of course, COVID-19, the big C word, which unfortunately we have been particularly badly hit in the UK, although the South Central region hasn't been as bad as some other areas. But what we've been able to do is to actually map hotspots. This looks at wave one, uh, which basically was around about April 2020. And you can see that we've got some significant hotspots. And you may say, well, why is that important? Well, for example, if we found we had high levels, then we would pump prime a whole load more PPE uh, into those areas. So if we found that we did, as we did here, you can see Southampton in the south and also the Portsmouth area and parts of Milton Keynes as well, we're seeing very high levels of COVID. Um, what that meant is that we could actually uh, you know, equip our staff much better. We also were able to do local information so we could give staff better understanding of what they should do in terms of the conveyance and non conveyance of patients with COVID-19. We can then look at another phase. So this is looking at wave two and you'll see it is slightly different. We've got what we've described as the dumbbell of death in the south. I have no idea why, but we obviously saw a big uh, increase in COVID around there in wave two. So this is looking at sort of October 2020. But again, you can see pockets. And in fact, Reading was one of our hotspots that we saw. So fascinating work. And we were able to literally map that uh, live time. So in summary, SCAS are using EPR data to improve patient care. Um, the key for any ambulance service who are considering introducing electronic patient records uh, is the training and the familiarity, allowing staff time to actually experiment, to play around with mock devices, etc., and to make sure that they've got adequate training. I certainly would advise that you uh, use keyboards as well. That de definitely brought down our on-scene times quite significantly. And as you can see, the output from EPR can be used to improve clinical care and reporting. We've really got some amazing reports to the point where we've almost got so much data that we don't need to know what to do with it. And of course, it can be used to inform improvements in resourcing and in our deployment models. So for us, EPR has been really the best thing since sliced bread and uh, actually is really improving the, the care that our patients are now receiving in SCAS. Now, I was going to ask about questions, but I think the uh, guidance is that uh, questions are going to come at the end. But again, I'd just like to say thank you very much for inviting me to your conference, and I hope that you all have a really good day.